To start off this lecture, we're going to be talking about linked genes. Now, this is a concept that we've discussed before whenever we were going over meiosis. Genes that are linked are just genes that are on the same chromosome. Now, if you remember, we talked about the law of independent assortment, and we said that genes that are on different chromosomes can sort independently. But genes that are on the same chromosome are not able to do that. So let's just first, again, revisit this idea of the law of independent assortment between genes that are found on different chromosomes. Here I have a genotype of an individual, and you can see they're heterozygous for both traits. And remember, when we were trying to determine the gametes that this individual would produce, sometimes they pass on the big A with the big B or the big A with the little b. And that's what this is showing you in this diagram. So depending on how these chromosomes line up, Sometimes they line up like this, or sometimes the big B and little b can be in different positions. And so sometimes we get the big A with the big B or the big A with the little b. Sometimes, though, we're going to get the little a with the big B and the little a with the little b. And we see those here. So we get four different types of gametes, four different genotypes that we can pass on to the next generation. Now let's take a look at this other diagram because this is talking about linked genes. Here we have the exact same genotype. So again, we have an individual that is heterozygous for both traits. But you can see we only have two copied chromosomes here because these two genes are located on the same chromosome. So the only B that can get passed on with this capital A is the big B because they're located on the same chromosome. And we see that we get these gametes right here, capital A, capital B, and capital A, capital B. And then when we look over here, we can see that only this little a is going to be passed on with this little b. So we get this different combo over here. Now notice we just have two different possible genotypes that we can create in the gametes. Here we had four, and here we had two because these genes were linked in the second part of the diagram. Now as I mentioned, we've already talked about linked genes before, and we've already worked some problems regarding linked genes. Remember we did the Sorderia lab, we figured out the percent of the offspring that were showing crossover, and that told us the distance between the gene that code for spore color and the centromere. So let's revisit this idea. So if you remember, the distance between genes in MAP units is simply the percent of recombination or crossover, or we could say the percent of the offspring that have the recombinant phenotype or that show crossover. So if 26% of the offspring showed a recombinant phenotype, when we have a dihybrid cross where we're looking at eye color and fur color, then that tells us that our map unit distance between these two genes is 26 map units. There's our answer. So if we were going to map out this chromosome, then we would have one gene, and let's put eye for eye color, and then we have another gene for fur color, and since we see recombination 26% of the time in the offspring, then the distance from these two genes is 26 MAP units. You probably recognize number two here because we worked several of these problems before. We can use crossing over percents or recombination percents to then map out genes on a chromosome. So in this situation, I'm going to draw my chromosome, and I'm going to start with the big number. So I'm going to put A and B here because we know that they are 30 MAP units apart because we see crossover 30% of the time between those two genes. And now I just have to figure out where C is going to be located. So if A and C cross over 10% of the time, then the MAP unit distance between A and C is going to be 10. So I'm going to just put a mark here and indicate from here to here was 10. And then if I take a look at this last clue, it says C and B are 20. So if C is in fact right here, which it is, then that would give a distance between A and C of 10 and C and B of 20. Now we're going to go more in depth with problems regarding linked genes. Now, since we're talking about two different traits, because we have two different genes on the same chromosome, then we're going to be working with dihybrid crosses. And we've just finished up talking about dihybrid and trihybrids.
So far, all the different dihybrids that you have done have been between two genes that are on different chromosomes. They've been unlinked so far. Now, if you remember whenever we were doing chi-square with monohybrid crosses, and we were comparing our observed to our expected, if those numbers had a significant difference between the two, then it was telling us that something isn't right. Maybe the alleles are lethal, and we're not accounting for that. Or maybe we thought the parents had these genotypes, but in fact, their genotypes were different. So that's why we're getting different observed numbers than what was expected. So whenever our expected and our observed was a poor fit, we had to figure out what's going on. Well, that's what's going to happen here when we do these dihybrid crosses. And we're going to get some expected numbers. But if our observed numbers are off from what we expected and we're doing a dihybrid cross, then it is probably because these two genes are not assorting independently because they are linked. So how are you going to be able to look at the results of a dihybrid cross? And you can tell it's dihybrid because we have eyes and we have body type. Over here, we have two things. We have um, body color and we have um, the development of wings. So there's two different traits. These are dihybrid crosses. You have to be able to look at the numbers from an experiment and indicate that the results we are getting is because these two genes are linked. They're on the same chromosome. So here's how you're going to figure that out. When you take a look at these numbers, if you have two phenotypes that have a similar frequency, kind of like you see right here, and then the other two have the same frequency or very similar frequency, then you know you have two genes that are linked. So if you take a look over here, you can see that these two numbers are very close to one another. And then these two numbers are very close together. So that must mean that body color and wing development is on the same chromosome. After a few practices, it's going to be a piece of cake to determine if two traits are on the same chromosome. It's usually pretty easy to pick out that you've got two numbers very similar, and then the other two numbers are very similar for the different phenotypes you get in a dihybrid cross. Now we're going to get into a little bit of history about linked genes and give some credit to Thomas Morgan. He was a geneticist in the early 1900s, and his work with fruit flies taught us a lot about chromosomes and how genes are inherited. And specifically, he figured out that two different traits can be located on the same chromosome. He realized that when he was doing some dihybrid crosses and he wasn't getting the results that he was expecting, it was because these two genes were on the same chromosome. And he also hypothesized about crossing over. Because sometimes he would get recombination in the offspring. This is an illustration by Thomas Morgan of crossing over in the early 1900s. So let's go through one of his famous experiments and what he experienced, which led him to this idea of linked genes. So he was working with heterozygous females. So they're heterozygous for two different traits, body color and wing development. And then he had males that were black, and they had this type of wing on them. And they were homozygous recessive for both traits. Now, gray is dominant to black, and normal wings are dominant to vestigial wings. So whenever he was doing this cross, this is what he expected, right? So again, we're going to figure out the different gametes that the female can produce. Sometimes she can package up big G with a big N in a gamete. Big G, little n. Little G, big N. Little G, little n. And the males can only create one type of gamete. Little G, little n. So when we bring these down and complete the genotypes, then this is what we should get. We should get an even ratio of gray normal, gray vestigial, black normal, and black vestigial. So this is the ratio that we should have gotten. But that wasn't the case for Thomas Morgan. He should have gotten numbers like 203, and then maybe 199, and 205, and maybe 192. So we should have got very similar numbers for the offspring with the different phenotypes. But this is what he actually got. 
And you can see this is nowhere near a one-to-one-to-one -one -one ratio. And we now know it is because the two genes for body color and wing shape were linked. They're on the same chromosome. And these offspring that we see right here, they are recombinants. The only way that you're going to get offspring that look like that is if there is some crossover between the genes on that chromosome. And once again, you should be able to look at these numbers and see that we have two sets of numbers that are very similar to one another, and we have two sets over here that are very similar. And we get a very low number of them since it was due to crossing over. And that doesn't happen every single time, obviously. So let's take a look at what really was happening with these fruit flies that he was crossing. So again, remember the female was heterozygous for both traits. Well, you can see that the big G was linked with the big N. And we could only get two types of gametes because they were linked. So she only produced a gamete with this genotype and a gamete with this genotype. And again, the only gamete that those males could produce was this gamete, little g, little n. So you can see why we have a really large number of these two phenotypes over here. We got 203 gray normal, and then we got 195 black listed jewel. Now, the reason why we got few of these other phenotypes, four that were black with normal wings, and I believe that says six, gray with vestigial, is because the females created a few gametes with different combinations because of crossover. So due to crossover, we did get a few chromosomes packaged into gametes that had a big G and a little n. See that? And then we also had some that had a little g and the big N. Just a few, though, because that's why we only got a few offspring with these phenotypes. So again, bring them down, take them across. And that explains these results that we got. Linked genes. These two genes for this trait were on the same chromosome. So now we're going to take a look at some other problems that you're going to have to work related to linked genes. So again, we've talked about this rule several times. The distance between two genes is equal to crossover percent or recombination percent or the percent of the recombinants and the offspring. So let's look at this first example. So it said, Morgan observed the following results. Calculate the distance in math units between the gene for body color and the gene for wing shape. Of course, when we see numbers like this, it should just scream that these two genes are linked. Remember in the Sorderi lab, we calculated the percent of the offspring that showed crossover. So that's what we're going to do in this situation. These offspring were due to crossover. Or we say that they are the recombinants. These are the recombinant offspring. Make sure you know that term. So let's calculate the percent of the offspring that were recombinants. We have 10 of them. And then if we add up all the different offspring, that gives us 408. So we saw crossover about 2.5%. So we get a number, we times it by 100, that's going to give us our percent. So if we were going to map out the distance between these two genes, so we're going to put body color and wing, they're very close together. As a matter of fact, the distance from here to here is 2.5 map units. This is a good time to reemphasize that the closer two genes are on a chromosome, the lower amount of crossover we're going to see between the two. So that's why we had such a small number of recombinants, because these genes are very close to one another on this chromosome. All right, let's take a look at another example. 
says in a dihybrid cross, it was determined that one recombinant phenotype occurred 5% of the time. So as soon as you see recombination there, crossing over, we're dealing with genes that are linked. So let's calculate the map distance between the two genes studied and the cross. Now remember, we're going to end up with four different phenotypes. So let's write pheno1, and we're going to get a number of those offspring with that phenotype. Let's write pheno2, and then we're going to get the recombinants. We're going to have one recombinant, and you're going to have another recombinant. Remember, these two numbers are going to be the same. And these two numbers are going to be very close to the same. So it's saying that one recombinant phenotype occurred 5% of the time. That means the other one we're going to get about 5% of the time. So now we have 100% minus 10%, and that leaves 90% to divide between these other two. So we're going to see this phenotype 45 percent of the time and this one about 45 percent of the time but going back to what the question is asking you it says calculate the math distance between the two genes studied in this cross we have to get our total recombinant percent in this situation you can see that it would be 10 percent so that means that the distance between these genes is 10 mu's math units Take a second to read through example three, four, and five and see if you can answer some of these questions and then you can check here in a second. So looking at example three, we're crossing snapdragons and we can see that for the first cross, we have individuals that are homozygous dominant for both traits. Being crossed with individuals that are homozygous recessive for both traits. And that should make sense that all of the progeny are gonna be heterozygous for both traits. And then we're going to take some of these progeny and cross them, again, with some plants that are homozygous recessive. Now, if you remember, whenever you cross in a dihybrid cross, organisms that are heterozygous for both traits with those that are homozygous for both traits, you should get a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one genotypic ratio. Well, we can see that we're not quite there with what we got. So that indicates that something is going on and in this case we can tell that the genes are linked. This question is asking you to calculate the map unit distance between genes C and D that are linked. And remember to do that you have to determine the percent of crossover or the percent of the progeny that is showing the recombinant phenotypes and that's going to give you your distance and map units between the two genes. Now I want to make sure that you understand this information in the box. This is simply saying that you can tell that these two genotypes are due to recombination. They are the recombinants. When you have genotypes of a higher frequency, then those genotypes are not due to recombination. And the genotypes with the higher frequency and the offspring are going to be genotypes that match the genotypes of the parents in the cross either one parent or both parents. In this case, both of these genotypes, where we have a higher frequency, is matching the genotypes of the parents. So we can see that the greatest number of offspring is having genotypes that match the parents in the cross. So that means these lower frequencies that we see here are genotypes that are due to recombination. Now, I probably went through more information than I needed to because you probably already determined that C was the correct answer that these genes are 40 map units apart because you added 20 plus 20. But I just want to emphasize that when you're looking at the results of a cross, the higher percents are not going to be the recombinants. The lower percents are going to represent the offspring that are recombinants. For example, four, it says two genes are 18 map units apart. What percent of the offspring should show the recombinant phenotype, black body and vestigial wings? Well, I want you to understand that this is just one recombinant phenotype. There's another one, so there's going to be a recombinant phenotype too, and these have to add up to equal the distance between the two genes. So if the genes are 18 map units apart, then that means that 9% of the offspring would show that recombinant phenotype, 9% would show the second one, but officially the answer to this question is just 9%. But I wanted to make sure you understood how I got 9% as the answer. For example five, we have linked genes, 
And they're giving you a diagram here that shows you which chromosome possesses which alleles. So we can see that for this individual right here, on one chromosome, they have the two dominant alleles for these two different genes. And on this chromosome, they've got two recessive alleles for those two recessive genes. And we can see that this individual can only pass on chromosomes that have two recessive alleles. So A says, write the genotype of the two parents. So this is the chromosome of parent one right here. And so we can see that they have big L, little l, and they have big G, little g. And then for the other parent, they are little l, little l, little g, little g. They're homozygous for both traits. It says, if the genes were on different chromosomes and independently sorted in meiosis, how many gametes would the first parent produce? And that question should say, how many different gametes would the first parent produce? So in this situation, if they could independently assort, then that means that sometimes the parent would package up in a gamete the big L and the big G, or the big L, the little G, little L, big G, little L, little G. So we would get four different gametes if they could independently assort, and they would be what we just indicated, big L, big G, big L, little g, little l, big g, little l, little g. But C says, let's say that they are linked and no crossing over is occurring. Show a cross to determine the genotypic ratios of the offspring between these two parents. So we're going to set up a very simple Punnett square here. And we know that since the genes are linked and that no crossing over is occurring, that one parent is going to put this chromosome into a gamete. So one gamete, or one type of gamete that they're going to be able to produce has both of those dominant alleles in it. And the other one is going to have the recessive alleles in it. And those are the only two types of gametes that they can make if no crossing over is occurring. And then we have this parent over here, and the only type of gamete it can make is going to have a combination of those recessive alleles. So now let's do a simple Punnett square here, and we can see that we're going to get these offspring. So we would get a one-to-one -one ratio if no crossing over is occurring. Now, if we did get some crossover, we would see a very large number with these genotypes and phenotypes, and then we would get a few that are due to recombination. But again, in C, it just says, show across assuming that no crossing over is occurring that the genes are linked. Example six is a good example of an AP question. Now, these are examples of four point questions. So whenever you're writing a response, you have to make four different valid conclusions to get you four points. So take a second to read through example six and answer A and see if you can come up with four points. Remember, whenever you're writing answers to short answers, you cannot leave bullets or lists or one-word answers. You have to write out your answer in a statement, in a complete sentence. So when I tackle A, I think of there's two different parts of this question. It says, what conclusions can be drawn from cross one and cross two? And explain how the data supports your conclusions for each cross. Now, I don't have a lot of room, so I'm going to make my answers as bullets just so that you can check to see if you had the right concepts. But again, you cannot do this on the actual AP exam. You have to write out your answers in complete statements. So first of all, looking at cross one, let's figure out some conclusions. So we took some true breeding bronze-eyed males, and we crossed them with true breeding red-eyed females. Now, just because we're starting to say males and females does not mean that this trait is sex-linked. We have to look at the results, and that's going to help us determine if it is autosome or sex link. But again, just because it starts to say males and females, don't automatically think that you have a trait that is going to be sex linked. It says when we crossed the bronze eyed males and the red eyed females, all the F1 offspring had bronze eyes. So that tells me right there that bronze is going to be dominant to red. So that's one conclusion. So I'm going to write here conclusion, and I'm going to put for cross one. And we're going to put bronze is dominant. All right, so let's take a look at the data that supports conclusion because that's where we're going to get some additional points here. So let's support this. 
So one reason why we know that bronze is dominant to red is because all the F1s were bronze. So that could get you a point. But you could also say that whenever we cross the F1s, we obtained a 3 to 1 ratio in that F2 generation. So that would prove that we are crossing two heterozygous individuals and bronze is dominant to red. Another conclusion that we can make is that since we're getting an even number of males and females with each trait, then we can say that for eye color, it is autosomal. So let's indicate it's an autosomal trait. And then our support would be an even number of males and females. Developing both the bronze eyes and the red eyes. Now looking at cross two, we can make some conclusions about that as well. And we have pretty much the exact same thing going on. So I'm not going to rewrite my conclusions um, and the different support statements. But we can conclude that stunted wings is dominant to normal wings because all the F1s had stunted wings. And also when we cross the F1s to get the F2s, again, we get a 3 to 1 ratio. And we can also tell that it's an autosomal trait because, again, we have an even number of males and females for both of those phenotypes. So take a look at what you wrote to see if you would have gotten four points for part A. If you haven't, take a second to read through cross three and see if you can come up with four points in your answer. So here are some conclusions that we can make. Each one would give you a point. So one conclusion that we can make is that the genes for wing shape and eye color are linked. And we can tell because we have a very small number of these different phenotypes that we did have some crossover. So crossing over occurred. And another conclusion that you can make is the distance between the two genes on the chromosome. So you could do that by adding up the total number of recombinants. So we could do 220 plus 260. And then you have to divide by all the different numbers. So let me move this down a little bit. So you would have 2,360 plus 220 plus 260 plus 200, sorry, 2,240. And then we'll get a decimal times by 100. And then that's going to give you a recombination percent. And that's going to equal to the map unit distance between these two genes. So let's do our support, though. Now, we can tell that these genes were linked because when we did this cross, when we crossed those F1 offspring, remember, they were heterozygous for both traits with those true breeding homozygous recessive individuals. Then we should have gotten, we should get a 1 to 1 to 1 to one ratio. And the fact that we didn't get that indicates that these genes would be linked. Now we can tell that crossing over is occurring because we're getting four different phenotypes here. I'm going to go back to this previous question that we worked up here. Do you see how when we had linked genes, we should only get two different types of offspring if no crossing over is occurring? Well, since we do have crossing over occurring, then we're getting four different phenotypes. So let's indicate with no crossing over, we should get a one-to-one -one ratio. And the fact that we didn't get that indicates that some crossing over is occurring. Now for this last conclusion we made, if we do the math, then we can tell that these two genes are 10 map units apart. And we can justify that because we can indicate that 10% of the offspring were recombinant phenotypes. So you can see there are six different ideas that you could put down in the answer. And so you would get a point for each one up to a maximum of four. Now, this was a released question 
So this was the exact scoring guide that was used by the people that were scoring these short answer questions. So you can see that they were looking for those two different ideas. Can you draw a conclusion? And then can you justify it or explain why you concluded that? And they did that for each one of these conclusions. On this page, we're continuing with linked genes. But I want to show you about how we can write genotypes using linked gene notation in case you're shown this information this way on an AP problem. So the problem with writing an individual's genotype like this, if they're heterozygous for both traits, is if the genes are linked, we do not know which alleles are found on the same chromosome and are going to be sorted together into the gamete. So is the big A with the big B or is the big A with the little b? Well, that's where linked gene notation comes in handy. And this is what I mean by linked gene notation. We're showing genotypes. So we're just indicating what two alleles are together on the same chromosome. So question one says, an individual has this genotype. On the following chromosomes, show the genes that will be found on each chromosome. So that means that we have a capital A allele and a capital B allele found on the same chromosome. And we have the lowercase, the recessive allele, and this recessive allele found on the same chromosome as well. Question two says, body color and eye shape are found on the same chromosome. We have black bodies recessive to the wild type. Now remember, Talking about wild type, we will put a plus there on the letter that codes for that allele to indicate that it's wild type. And wild type simply means the phenotype that is most common. So that means that black body here is due to a mutation. So we have lobed eyes, and that's due to a mutation. And it is dominant to wild type in this situation. It says an individual is heterozygous for both traits, and the wild type genes are on the same chromosome. Write the genotype using linked gene notation. So what that means is, on one chromosome, is we have these different wild types. So that's one wild type, and there's the other wild type. So that means that, since they're heterozygous for both traits, we have that mutant for black body, allele found on this chromosome. And then we have, for lobe dyes, found on this one. Because it's told us in the prompt that the wild type genes are on the same chromosome. So write the genotype using linked gene notation. So that means that we're going to put these two alleles together on one chromosome and these two alleles on the other chromosome. B says the following parents were crossed. Determine the expected outcome if no crossing over occurred. So now we're going to set up a Punnett square here. And we have to determine the genotypes of the gametes that these two parents can create. Well, we know that the only genotype combination this parent can pass on is the B with the L on a chromosome. But we know that this parent can package up a B and an L in one gamete. And they can also make gametes that have this allele combination in it. So bring them down and take them across. I'm going to put it in linked gene notation. So that's given us the genotypes of the offspring, assuming that no crossing over is occurring. Anytime we're crossing an individual that is heterozygous for both traits with an individual that is homozygous recessive for both traits, and we have linked genes with no crossing over, you're always going to get a one-to-one -one ratio. Now remember, if crossing over does occur, then we're going to get a few recombinants. So just to give you an example of numbers that we could get for the offspring. Imagine if we got about, let's say, 230 of these, and you would get close to, um, let's be realistic, and let's say we got 226 of those. And then for these other genotypes that we could see in the offspring if crossing over was occurring, then we could get some really small numbers here. So maybe we get like 15 and maybe 18 of those two different types of recombinants, okay? But again, I just want to show you if no crossing over is occurring, then this is what you would get. You would get a one-to-one -one ratio. The next problem says 40% of the offspring were that genotype given, homozygous recessive for both traits. Determine the genotypes and phenotypes of the other three types of offspring that would be born if crossing over did occur between the two genes. So we know that these are the individuals we get if no crossing over is occurring. So these are the genotypes that we expected and here's one, we already indicated it here. So the, again, the other one was this genotype. And I'm just copying it off of this Punnett square here. 
and we know that we should get the same amount of those. So I'm going to put 40% here. Now, we have 80%, and so we should have 100% of the offspring accounted for. So that means that we're going to get a recombinant phenotype and genotype at 10%, and the other recombinant genotype and phenotype at 10%. So let's see if we can figure out what these other two genotypes are going to be of crossing over is occurring. So for this third genotype, we know that the first parent can only pass on these two alleles, a B and an L, on a chromosome because that's all they have. But if we look at this other parent, again, they were heterozygous for both traits. We might get some crossing over. So let's think of the different combinations we could get on a chromosome. We could get the B with this wild type L. which means that we would also get this wild type B with the mutant L. And again, the other parent can only pass on a chromosome that has those mutant alleles, the B and the L. So these are the different combinations that we would get if crossing over is occurring, and those would be the recombinants. D says calculate the percent of the progeny that were recombinants. So again, we would know that we have to add these two percents together to give us 20%. You can probably tell where we're going with this. What was the frequency of crossover? It would be 20% because it is equal to the percent of the recombinants that we have in offspring. And then F says, how many map units apart are the genes for body color and eye shape? So then that would simply be 20 map units. Now that we've covered linked genes and we've been through all the exceptions to Mendelian genetics, we're going to take a second to review the ideas that were developed by Mendel. And again, those ideas are referred to as Mendelian genetics. And we're going to take a look at some genetic exceptions to those rules. So let's go through and just highlight and reemphasize these principles of Mendelian genetics. So Mendel said that for every trait, each individual has two alleles. He says that each individual passes on only one of their two, and this is the law of segregation. So he stated that if you have two different alleles, and let's make someone heterozygous, that one is going to get passed on, or the other one is going to get passed on, that you do not pass on both of your alleles to the next generation. He also said that there's two alleles for every trait, and that one is always dominant and the other one is going to be recessive. And I'm going to add, this was his law of dominance. And then he said that the inheritance of one trait is not going to influence the inheritance of the other. So he's talking about if you have a trait like flower color and plant height, that plant height and what you inherit isn't going to affect flower color and vice versa. And so he said, this is the law of independent assortment. Mendel also said that for every trait, one allele is always from one parent, and one allele is always from the other. So let's take a look at the exceptions to his rules to review, since we've covered all these different exceptions, everything from incomplete dominance um, to linked genes. So again, for this first rule, for every trait, each individual has two alleles. Well, we know that's not always the case because some traits like eye color or seed color or skin color are polygenic. There's not just one gene with two different alleles that are developing or coding for that phenotype. So if eye color is determined by three different genes, and there's two alleles for each of those different genes, so that's six alleles possibly giving you your final eye color, it is definitely not two, like Mendel thought. Traits that are sex-linked, like hemophilia, do not follow this rule. Because we know that males have an X and a Y, and so the genes on the X are different from the genes that are on the Y. So they're only going to have one allele that will code for this trait. So for colorblindness, males only have one allele for that trait. For hemophilia, they only have one allele for that trait. So again, this is not fitting Mendel's rule that for every trait, each individual has two alleles. Moving down to the next one, it says each individual passes on only one allele of the two. We know sometimes that doesn't happen because of non-disjunction. 
so when we have syndromes like Down syndrome, which is due to aneuploidy, having an extra chromosome, or like with Turner syndrome, we're missing a chromosome. We know that the parent didn't pass on one of their two alleles. Whenever there's an extra chromosome, that means a parent passed on two. Or if we're missing a chromosome, we're down to 45, then that means that the parent didn't pass on any of those alleles to the next generations. In that law of dominance, Mendel said that one allele is always going to be dominant to the other one. But we know that's not always the case. For example, with sickle cell anemia, we had alleles that were co-dominant. We say those alleles show co-dominant. So we did not have one that was dominant and one that was recessive. Both alleles are dominant. So that's an exception to the rule. We have some traits that show incomplete dominance. So again, we do not have a dominant allele and recessive allele. We end up with getting an intermediate of the two in this case. So again, an exception to this law of dominance. And in addition, let's talk about this first part where it says there are two alleles for every trait. One is dominant, one's recessive. Well, in blood types, we have three different alleles in our population, not just two. So some traits have multiple alleles. So we just don't have two that we find for this one trait. Now, Mendel said that traits sort independently of one another, but we know that's not always the case because sometimes traits are linked on the same chromosome, so those genes cannot independently assort. And this last one says that for every trait, one allele is always from mom and one allele is always from dad. But again, with these sex-linked traits, that's not always the case because males are going to get the X and those genes from mom. And so they only have one allele for every trait. And then they get the Y from their dad. So all those genes on there, they're only getting one allele that's going to code for their phenotype. So that is an exception to this law of Mendelian genetics. For the last part of this lecture, we're going to take a look at problems where we're given data. And there's no pattern to this information that we're given. So we have to be able to come up with a plausible reason as to why we're getting this data. So looking at this information, you can see that we're crossing individuals that are different colors. We got all red, and then we cross two of the reds, and we get this in the F2 generation. And you can see that we're making several crosses here. And again, you're probably realizing that this doesn't look like any of the other problems that we've done before. So let's think of what could be causing the development of these different phenotypes in these different frequencies. So here's some plausible explanations to this data. So in this case, it could be that flower color could be influenced by an environmental factor. Maybe the soil pH is affecting a color, or maybe the amount of sunlight that the plants are receiving is affecting color. Another possibility is that as these plants develop, then they could be changing colors as they're going through different stages. We see this happen in animals. So as they mature, their hair will turn a darker color or they'll develop more hair and so on. So there's different traits that we develop as we go through different stages. So that could be a possible explanation to this data. And then another plausible explanation is that there could be a second gene or a third gene that is affecting the expression of the gene that's coding for flower color. So take a second to pause, read through example one, and see if you can determine the best answer for this question. Reading through my options here, I do not like option A. And the reason why is because if flower color was being determined by the environment, then they would have to give me that information about where they're planting these plants in each generation. They would have to tell me if they're being planted in soils of different pH, or if some of the offspring, like the F2s, are planted where they're getting more sunlight. Because they're not giving me that information, I cannot determine that flower color is being influenced by an environmental factor. I do not like option B for almost the exact same reason, is if flower color is changing as these flowers are developing, then I have to know what stage of development they're in and they're not giving me that information, so that's why I do not like B. Now, with C, the reason why I do not like C is because of this term right here. So this is a vocab word that many of you probably are unfamiliar with. 
And normally I teach about this whenever I teach my plant unit. But I know that whenever they change the curriculum, that I no longer have to teach a unit about plants. So since there is no prompt that attempts to explain what this vocabulary word is, then I know that it's not a plausible answer because you don't have to know at the end of this course what vegetative propagation is. And so that leaves us with B. The most plausible answer is there's probably another gene that is influencing the gene that's coding for flower color. Take a second to look at example two, and you can check your answer here in a second. I feel like this is a pretty easy question because they're talking about, finally, that there's a change in the environment, that we have acidic soil conditions and basic soil conditions. So this is showing you that genes and their expression can be influenced by environmental conditions. So C is the correct answer to example two.